Publicity Scholar, Professor Paul Richard. Dr. Richard is Mellon Professor of Natural Sciences and Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University in New York. His research focuses on the theory of seismic wave propagation, as well as the use of seismological methods to study underground nuclear explosions, and of course the implications in both scientific and political worlds. In 1994, he was a member of the U.S. delegation to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, helping to negotiate a comprehensive test ban treaty. Professor Richards is a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Fellowship. He's a visiting physicist at Livermore National Laboratory, Orson Anderson, visiting scholar at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and twice a Foster Fellow or Scholar at the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. He's a fellow of the AAAS, the American Geophysical Union, winning the McElwain Medal in 1977. He's the co-author of a textbook, Quantitative Seismology, Theory and Methods. During his visit to ISU this week, he will give two talks. This is the first. Tomorrow afternoon at 4.10, he will speak on Earth's inner core, discoveries and conjectures. That's a scientific talk in 102 Science 1. This evening, his title is The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty his recent history, status, and prospects. Please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Richard. Thank you. Well, I uh, am here this evening to talk with you about a subject which uh, has a number of different uh, controversies uh, floating around it. Uh, specifically in the context of a recent decision made in the United States Senate, which has its uh, title of the world's greatest uh, deliberative body. I think that's one of its uh, uh, characterizations. Uh, but in last October, by a very substantial majority, voted to reject ratification by the United States of a comprehensive test ban treaty, which had been a declared foreign policy initiative of every president of the United States since Dwight Eisenhower. So I need to tell you a little about the history of this treaty and why the Senate voted as they did and what actions are taking place today perhaps to encourage a reconsideration of this treaty. But uh, I have to begin even uh, earlier to uh, perhaps give a sense of what this treaty is intended to achieve and indeed what is nuclear testing for. And in such a controversial subject, it is very important to try and find those areas where there is agreement. And so let me begin with one biograph which quotes the words of a former director of the Los Alamos, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory in which he is simply saying here that nuclear testing is a process deeply caught up in the procedures by which a nuclear weapons state develops that nuclear arsenal. Everyone really agrees with this. And in fact, uh, there have been about 2,000 nuclear weapons tests since Trinity in July of 1945, which I understand was actually witnessed by a gentleman in this room. Uh, 2,000 nuclear tests since that date, the latest being by Pakistan, on May 30th of 1998. So over a, a 40 to 50 year period, approximately one nuclear explosion a week for these decades, deeply caught up in the processes by which nuclear weapons have been developed in different countries. <coughs> well, nuclear weapons have their power in the context of, uh, perhaps if I can explain this best, uh, previous weapons, in the Second World War, up until 1945, a big bomb would have the yield of approximately one ton 
of some chemical explosive uh, equivalent, TNT, for example. One ton until Trinity and Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the big bomb. But that all changed in 1945. And you see here on the bottom left corner of that cube some representation of the 12,000 kilotons of the Hiroshima weapon. So that scales things up by a factor of 10 to the fourth, as a, as a scientist would, would put it. And then in the subsequent years, we see the uh, development of hydrogen bombs, which take things up another factor of a thousand. So that the largest cube of all, and its volume proportional to yield in this little diagram, was a nuclear weapon tested by the Soviet Union in October 1961 that was at the 58 megaton level. Again, to give you some numbers, adding together all of the explosive used in World War II was about two megatons. So at uh, 58,000 kilotons, or 58 megatons, you're talking about something almost 30 times bigger than all of World War II dropped out of a plane in a nuclear test by the Soviet Union near their island of Novaya Zemlya. And of course, uh, in the process of development of these tests, for many years, this was the symbol, the mushroom cloud, of atmospheric nuclear testing. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the weapons test in the Nevada test site in which a 200 millimeter artillery shell was fired over an eight mile distance as a potential tactical nuclear weapon. And that type of nuclear testing in the atmosphere with its associated fallout and the hue and cry over the damage associated potentially uh, from radioactivity in uh, strontium and iodine and other chemicals that get taken up by human beings, as well as the consideration of more controlled environments of nuclear testing, more suitable perhaps than the atmosphere, led to the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty, this is its formal name, of 1963, which indeed ended the atmospheric testing by the three countries that negotiated it, the United Kingdom, France, and uh, the United States, although, uh, excuse me, the United uh, Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union. Uh, France and China carried on with, with atmospheric testing. Uh, in fact, uh, the last atmospheric test by China was in 1980. But mostly, atmospheric testing came to an end in 1963, and both literally and figuratively went underground. Uh, I say figuratively because the hue and cry associated with that mushroom cloud in the public eye was no longer there, and the general public, I think, is not aware that, for example, since 1963 there have been about 1,500 underground nuclear weapons tests, uh, 200 by France, uh, uh, about 500 by the USSR, uh, none since the breakup of, of the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, about 800 by the, the United States underground. Uh, and uh, Through a period of negotiation uh, that um, was on again, off again for about 20 years, uh, resulting in 1996, at last, in a formally agreed to multilateral treaty, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty has just two basic obligations. The first one, in Article 1, this first paragraph, simply says a state party that agrees to this treaty will not carry out any nuclear weapon test explosion. And the second paragraph says 
that signatories will not help anybody else to carry out a nuclear weapons test explosion. That's the whole guts of the treaty. And the remaining 75 pages are largely about issues of verification and about how on-site inspections might be conducted and how the global network that would monitor compliance with this treaty will be built and operated. Which brings me to uh, perhaps why I am in this room. I'm a seismologist. Uh, I've worked as an academic, uh, mostly at Columbia University for the last 30 years. I wrote textbooks, I do research as a seismologist, and um, I became very interested in technical issues of nuclear arms control, specifically in the mid-1980s, when I had an opportunity and took it to go to Washington, and I joined in the first Reagan administration the unit that wrote the President's report to Congress on Soviet arms control violations. And a seismologist comes into this subject of nuclear arms control and certainly nuclear weapons testing because nuclear weapons tests generate signals literally heard around the world with a number of different technologies. A nuclear explosion in the atmosphere literally generates sound waves a somewhat lower frequency than our ears can pick up but certainly that can be picked up by microphones by infrasound. Nuclear explosions in the oceans generate enormous, uh, very loud amplitude sound waves in the ocean um, and nuclear explosions underground generate seismic waves which are routinely picked up by, for example, earthquake monitoring operations as carried out by thousands of seismologists around the world. It turns out that the underground environment for nuclear testing is both the most favorable one from the point of view of nuclear weapons design because underground can provide a fairly controlled environment for making careful measurements of what happens in a nuclear test and also provides uh, some facilities for hiding exactly what you're doing from potential adversaries. To turn that another way, uh, to the extent that the Soviet Union uh, and China have carried out an extensive series of underground nuclear weapons testing, the principal military intelligence technology for finding out what those potential adversaries of the United States might be doing, again, is, is seismology. But now I talk about this subject in the context of nuclear arms control. And the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty does have extensive verification provisions, which I'll come to uh, shortly. But let me remind you what happened in 1996. Uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, its text, after actually 40 years of negotiations, they began in the 1950s, was at last agreed to. And there's a whole history here about linkage to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the indefinite extension of that treaty, which was agreed to uh, 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 in, uh, in the 1990s. The uh, immediate uh, response to agreeing at last on the language of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was that in New York in September of 1996, within half an hour of that treaty being opened for signature, it was signed by the leaders of all five declared nuclear weapons countries. The United States, President Clinton was the first to sign, and as I say, within half an hour, also the signatures were received from the Russian Federation, from France, from China, and the United Kingdom, and subsequently by more than 150 other countries. And in signing, President Clinton stated that this was the longest sought, hardest fought battle in the history of arms control. Referring back perhaps to that 40 years of negotiation and to the many uh, difficult times 
including at the time uh, when the, the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty was last agreed to in 1963. Those negotiations were intended to be a comprehensive treaty, but failed in large part because of perceptions that at that time in the 1960s, a comprehensive treaty could not be adequately verified. Well, Clinton, uh, President Clinton, I think, was looking backwards when he summarized the situation this way. But uh, he could have certainly said the same thing uh, looking forwards. Because in um, 1999, as I've already indicated, this treaty uh, was trashed and burned uh, in the United States, uh, uh, in, in, in the United States Senate specifically. Before I get to that, I want to summarize a little about the level the funding we're talking about, let alone <coughs> the level of military power projected by deployed nuclear weapons. So, since the 1940s, uh, over a period of more than 50 years, a total of almost six trillion dollars has gone into building nuclear weapons and deploying them. Deploying them is the largest fraction. Testing them is <coughs> part of this slice of the cake. It's part of the process of designing and building them, as, as I've indicated. Which reminds me to say that the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is completely silent on the question of stockpiles of previously designed nuclear weapons. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is part of an international process to achieve uh, what is called in the jargon of arms control uh, a ban on vertical proliferation of nuclear weapons technology. Horizontal proliferation of nuclear weapons technology is when um, the technical information about nuclear weapons design spreads, as it were, sideways from the current nuclear weapons states to the hundreds of non-nuclear weapon states around the world. That's horizontal proliferation. Vertical proliferation is the jargon term for what happens with a nuclear power that continues to develop new designs, potentially new, more sophisticated, perhaps lighter nuclear weapons that can more easily be delivered. And the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty in the larger pattern of other arms control treaties is part of a network of efforts, including the non-proliferation treaty itself, to achieve uh, the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. <coughs> well, to remind you, uh, um, under the United States Constitution, after a uh, treaty is negotiated after it is signed it must still be ratified by all of the countries that have signed that treaty and ratification requires a domestic political process which is different in every country but in the United States it is required that the advice and consent of the Senate be obtained and the Senate must vote by a two-thirds majority in support of every treaty that is then ratified by the United States President. The Senate doesn't itself ratify, but its advice and consent to ratification <coughs> by a two-thirds vote must be received. And the Senate gives that advice and consent many, many times a year to varieties of treaties that are presented to it. And the last time that a serious treaty was not given the consent of the Senate uh, was uh, in between the two world wars when the League of Nations was voted down by the Senate. You have to look back that far uh, before finding a previous example of what happened in October 1999 when the Senate, by a vote of 51 no's and 48 yeses, uh, voted on its advice and consent to the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So to remind you of the arithmetic here, uh, here uh, the actual vote on advice and consent was 51 no, 
48 yes, that was 100 senators. Uh, senator Robert Byrd, uh, for the first time in his long career as a senator, simply voted present. It's the first time he ever decided not to vote. He was so, as he said, disgusted by the process that happened that he was not prepared to vote yes or no. Uh, and for that treaty to have passed, it would have required a vote of 67 yes, but it got a vote of 51 no. Well, the hints of, of major trouble arose uh, when uh, uh, eventually, after signing that treaty in 1996, President Clinton submitted it for consideration of the Senate, and the uh, relevant uh, committee of jurisdiction in this case is the Committee on Foreign Relations, chaired by Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina. And in this letter of 1998, he reported back to the president in barely polite language, as you can read it, that this treaty did not merit serious consideration by his committee, and that in fact he regarded uh, it important first to achieve progress on a couple of other little issues, like agreeing to the Kyoto Protocol and the amendments of the ABM Treaty, which I may say are going absolutely nowhere, uh, but uh, he essentially said those hurdles had to be jumped first before his committee would begin consideration. So as likely as possible, this, this letter says uh, uh, that this uh, treaty is not going to be given uh, serious hearings, for example, in the Senate. But then, after that 1998 dated letter, a number of senators who very much wanted this treaty to receive the consent of the Senate, not realizing, I think, what intense opposition there was to it, as represented by Senator Helms and many other senators, began to speak more and more vociferously to the effect that they would hold up the business of the United States Senate unless the Senate took up its constitutional duty of giving serious hearings to that arms control treaty and took it through the process of advice and consent the way that every other serious foreign policy uh, treaty had been handled in the Senate since that League of Nations uh, debacle before the, before the Second World War. Uh, so in uh, September 1999, matters got to a head in which a small number, uh, about three or four senators, seriously advocating this treaty, said they would hold up the business of the Senate unless this treaty were put on a track towards hearings and, and a full vote in the Senate. And suddenly, um, the Senate Majority Leader, Trent Lott, in late September, announced that, okay, if that is the situation, that treaty would be brought up before the full Senate for a, an immediate vote, uh, I say immediate, on a time scale of about three weeks. And to remind you, uh, normally on a matter of serious uh, national security concern, the treaty before the United States Senate goes through many months of detailed technical hearings. Um, Senate staff become uh, familiar in detail with the pros and cons. Um, an informed debate is, is held in a number of different forums, but uh, in this case uh, it was not to be. There were hearings held, um, uh, a couple of classified hearings before Senate Armed Services. Um, a number of newspapers <coughs> reported, up here for example, some headlines from the Washington Post on October the 3rd, 1999, um, statements about verification. Um, and all at the last minute, a hundred senators did then engage in three days of debate before taking that final vote. At one stage, 62 senators made a request, looking down the road, seeing that there was going to be a net negative vote, 
62 of, out of 100 senators made a request to take this treaty off the table and simply not vote on it, not lock themselves in to the vote. But by the rules of the Senate, it took, as they call it, a unanimous consent to take consideration of the agenda. And clearly there were three or four senators whose unanimous consent was required to stop the train, and they would not consent. So under the procedures of the Senate, even though 62 senators did not want to conduct the vote, uh, wishing to have a more deliberate process, uh, it, it didn't happen, and the vote was forced, and uh, the results I've already told you. In those last-minute hearings, the first full day of debate in the Senate was October 8. The day beforehand, uh, there was a hearing before Senate Armed Services, uh, and a professor at Stanford with deep... Um, career-long knowledge of nuclear weapons design um, made two points. The first one to say that the stockpile of U.S. nuclear weapons would be maintainable in a safe and reliable way without the support of a nuclear test program. And his second point is to say that this treaty can be effectively verified. But um, a hearing like that before the first full day of debate simply has, has, has no impact. Um, amazingly, um, in those last days before the Senate debate, uh, the op-ed pages of newspapers around the world uh, were filled with, with opinions. Here we see in the New York Times, <laughs> the President of France, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the Chancellor of Germany writing an op-ed piece in the New York Times at the last minute before a Senate debate. That is an extraordinary way for communication of opinions on foreign policy between countries. And in this op-ed piece, these three leaders, uh, political leaders of, of the three main uh, strongest countries, I would have to say, in, in, in Europe, uh, almost plead with the Senate to, uh, to support a treaty which in their own countries had gone through the process of, uh, of, of ratification. <clears throat> but let us look at the remarks of Senator Helms in speaking, as he did, against this treaty, and he had five points against. The first one, that confidence in the reliability and of the stockpile would erode. The second, that warheads at some time in the future, if they can't be um, designed because there's no, you can't redesign them because uh, there's going to be no nuclear test program under a comprehensive treaty, um, would have to be at some level remanufactured. And, and he stated here that warheads could not be remanufactured to, to maintain. Um, already existing designs indefinitely in the stockpile. Uh, third, no future designs can be added. Uh, here he speaks in the fourth reason uh, against one of the other technical reasons for which nuclear testing has been used in the past. Uh, most nuclear weapons tests in the United States have been conducted by the Department of Energy and its predecessors, like under the Atomic Energy Commission, for example, under the very strongly held principle in this country that nuclear weapons remain under civilian control. But a small fraction of nuclear weapons tests have actually been conducted by the military, by the Department of Defense, under programs to learn what happens to military hardware in the environments of a nuclear explosion. And that is what this issue speaks to. Um, that type of <coughs> test of military hardware against the environment of a, a nuclear weapon could not be carried out under a comprehensive test ban treaty. And the fifth reason given by Senator Helms is the verification one. Now, stand back from this. Uh, these are the five reasons that were persuasive in getting that <coughs> vote against the treaty. Uh, which of them are political? Which ones are based on 
technical input. And to some level, they, they have the combination of both, I know. But actually, most of these are quite technical issues. <coughs> and uh, there had been no serious hearings on any of these issues before the Senate voting in full executive session. That's to say, all 100 senators, uh, as a committee of the whole, deciding this. Um, confidence in the reliability of the stockpile. Uh, well, the three nuclear weapons labs uh, directors, not only Los Alamos and Livermore, but I remind you the third nuclear weapons lab is Sandia National Laboratory in Albuquerque, which actually is the principal engineering laboratory. Once the designs have been developed by Livermore and Los Alamos, they are essentially turned over to, Los Alam uh, to, to Sandia for engineering and, and building the weapons that, that are eventually deployed in the stockpile. Uh, the three weapons lab directors testified that they could maintain confidence in the stockpile. And this is part of a separate uh, set of decisions associated with a funding program known as the Stockpile Stewardship Program, under which it is agreed, and this program is now underway, that four and a half billion dollars a year for the next 10 years at least are set aside for stockpile stewardship. That is to say, looking in detail at the many components of weapons now in the stockpile and by a variety of different procedures maintaining confidence that, that weapons in the stockpile will work. <coughs> and the three weapons lab directors testify that they um, have every expectation that that stockpile stewardship program will succeed. On the questions of remanufacturing, again, that, that's really part of the first issue. Now, the third issue, that's the central one for me, because that's the point, is it not, of those who advocate this treaty, that to say that the treaty is deficient because it does not permit further designs, I think here uh, Senator Helms is exactly right. And it goes deeply to the question of what are nuclear weapons for, what have they been for in the past and to the future, is there a need for, for, for uh, maintaining the capability continually for new designs? So that's the central issue, I think. In, in, in arms control, uh, should we have it or, or should we not have it? But to the extent that the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is part of a package of international treaties, including the Non-Proliferation Treaty and a series of, of initiatives to build down uh, stockpile levels, um, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is a very much a strongly desired objective. For example, uh, by the 180 or so countries who signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty as non-nuclear weapons states, did that uh, 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 reach that agreement with the expectation that the nuclear weapons powers would agree to be bound by a comprehensive test ban treaty and would stop vertical proliferation. So uh, it is true that, uh, that, that this is uh, uh, the reason in the eyes of, of Senator Helms against the comprehensive test ban treaty, but that is what the treaty is intended to achieve. Uh, on the question of hardening uh, military software, well, there have been numerous Department of Defense uh, military effects tests, as they're called, in the past. Uh, the data from them is, is still available, and there are many other ways to subject military hardware to a hostile environment uh, represented by nuclear explosions. I hardly would say that this is a first order issue. And this last issue, the verification issue, I think it's widely understood that the United States would not be bound by a treaty like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty to the extent that it could not be sure that all other signatures would be bound by that treaty. And so it's very important to build a system that monitors compliance. And this is largely a problem in seismology. <coughs> so, let me talk about that. Verification for a while. Uh, and let me give you a bit of the context here. That when the uh, 
comprehensive Hanstein Treaty was so <coughs> definitively uh, voted down, <coughs> President Clinton appointed a four-star, recently retired uh, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a four-star Army General, uh, General John Shalakashvili, to do two things. To, first of all, visit all 100 senators in private and to ask them what really were their concerns. Many have said that the vote in the Senate was in effect a second impeachment trial, um, uh, that, that really it wasn't to do with, uh, with uh, US foreign policy or matters of national security, but simply that in the deeply partisan uh, hostilities of uh, Washington in, in recent years, the Senate was not about to give President Clinton something that he so clearly uh, uh, wanted, which, which uh, as I said earlier, all American presidents, going back to, to President Eisenhower, have declared to be a national objective. They were not going to give him that. Well, was it really that? And General Shalakashvili's assignment was to find out what were the other issues that bothered the United States senators about this treaty. And the second was uh, to ask the general to see uh, if agencies within the United States government could come up with programs to meet whatever concerns senators had so that potentially the treaty could be resubmitted at some future date, perhaps in a more supportive environment. So that work is ongoing. Um, I am working uh, on three different projects myself uh, with, with General Shalikash, really. He has asked the National Academy of Sciences to carry out a review, and I'm working on the verification panel, which I chair, that's writing that report for him. Uh, the Jasons, an organization of physicists, has conducted a number of reviews of this issue for the general. And then a number of federal agencies directly have got their own review programs about how to address the concerns of various senators. Um, I will go on here to say that uh, the work of monitoring this treaty is actually done uh, in a number of different ways. National technical means is a jargon word which means the work that intelligence agencies do. It's specifically the type of monitoring that the United States can do unilaterally using satellites, using whatever connections it has uh, with um, facilities in, in other countries. Uh, not all of it's secret, but, but much of it's secret. The second level of monitoring is the work established by treaty language which I'll be talking about shortly, there is a, a major new international monitoring system um, costing about $200 million a year to install and about $100 million a year as an operating budget. That is the international monitoring system headquartered in, in Vienna that, that's, uh, that's now uh, uh, beginning operations. Uh, this treaty, as I said earlier, has been signed by more than 150 countries. <coughs> Most of those countries have now ratified the treaty. There are a number of significant holdouts. North Korea and India and Pakistan have not yet signed. The treaty is unusual in the conditions under which it can actually go into effect. It is required that all 44 countries specified in the treaty itself, which have operated nuclear power reactors, must sign and ratify this treaty before it can go into effect which means that any one of those 44 countries, and the list does include India and Pakistan and North Korea, in effect has a veto, because until they've all signed, this treaty can't go into effect. So I think the widely anticipated hope was that Russia and China and the United Kingdom and France, the United States, in other words, the nuclear weapons powers would all sign and ratify and then take the leadership role of persuading India and Pakistan not to get into that track, which I reminded you has cost the United States six trillion dollars of building up uh, nuclear weapons over the years, but instead uh, take another path. And India and Pakistan, their leadership has repeatedly indicated that under the right circumstances, as long as they did it both together, they would sign this comprehensive test entry. Uh, so. Uh, 
with that brief, uh, other history. I also want to say that uh, around the world there are thousands of seismometers in, operati- in operation by hundreds of institutions doing scientific research or monitoring earthquakes which obtain data of great interest for treaty monitoring purposes as well. So to talk a little more about treaty monitoring, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, that's its title, uh, operates an international data center and an international monitoring system which actually acquires the data and sends it into the data center using these four technologies, uh, radionuclides, seismology, acoustics, and infrasound. And uh, that work is associated with well, that's the same, exactly the same information as in this graphic. What I simply want to show you is a map of the world with lots of colored dots on it. This is where the $200 million to build up the network uh, is, is actually installed at 321 places around the world. And there's a network of seismometers that continuously record and continuously send data by satellite to the data center in Vienna. There's another network of 120 stations continuously recording, but they only sent data to Vienna for time intervals that are requested. Uh, There's a network of 60 essentially microphones listening around the world to the infrasounds of uh, an explosion in the atmosphere. Then there's networks in the ocean, and then a network of 80 stations around the world far more sensitive than anything yet installed anywhere. Listening, uh, listening is the wrong word, uh, sensing the uh, presence of the unique uh, radionuclides, for example, xenons, uh, uh, certain types of isotopes of xenon that are diagnostic in a nuclear weapons test if they appear in certain proportions, and the kryptons and the iodines and the, so on. Uh, large numbers of uh, uh, unstable isotopes that are generated by a nuclear weapons test that would provide, in a sense, the smoking gun of uh, in the presence of a nuclear weapons test one day. So this network has been gradually built up over a period of years. It's actually, uh, the seismic uh, part of it uh, is, is largely operational. It has been for five years. And the chief problem with operating it is that it has uh, to cope with about 50 earthquakes a day that are recorded by the network because it's a sensitive network but that have signal levels comparable to a small nuclear explosion or a large nuclear explosion um, and that somebody has to look at and reach a determination is that potentially a nuclear weapons test or can we all go back to sleep again because it's an earthquake well the perspective here (coughs) from the treaty monitoring network is indeed that one that only the potential nuclear explosion signals are the really important ones but I have already indicated to you that a third method of monitoring is to recognize the contribution that a far greater network than shown here can also contribute. There are thousands of seismometers, as I've already indicated to you, operated by people who are really interested in earthquakes and who, on an average of once a week for the last 40 years, have been noticing nuclear explosions and have developed their own facility both for detection and discrimination between those two different types of signals. So uh, it turns out that uh, global networks of seismometers to um, study nuclear weapons uh, explosions have received three times more money from the treaty monitoring side than to study earthquakes. When people think of seismology, they think of, of, of earthquakes, but I'm saying that three times more money has actually been pumped into this science uh, because of the national security need to to, to monitor nuclear explosions. Well, I can tell you a great deal about the detection and location capabilities and how to discriminate uh, between earthquakes and explosions. Uh, That's been my professional life for the last 15 years. Um, But I'd like to talk about some very specific events that have had an impact upon the Senate for example. 
in its uh, decision in 1999. So let me just uh, go through a little more anecdotal uh, account of one or two particular seismic events of interest. So it turns out that um, in 1997, here I'm showing you a map here of Novaya Zemlya, which is the island north of the Russian uh, continent, um, uh, which is the location in the blown up view here of the nuclear weapons testing uh, history of, 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 of Russia uh, in, in, in recent years. And in 1997 appeared an article in the Washington Times stating that after having signed this comprehensive test ban treaty in 1996, Russia had carried out a nuclear weapons explosion. And the Clinton administration knew about it, but were just too afraid to do anything. Well, it turns out, uh, after extensive analysis, that what had happened was that a small earthquake had occurred <coughs> at this location in August of 1997, and that the various um, agencies charged with, with monitoring for the United States <coughs> had wrongly identified it. So here's the headline from the Washington Post a few months later, uh, laying out in detail what apparently had happened. And indeed, after that seismic event uh, in uh, the Kara Sea, north of the Russian landmass, when that earthquake had occurred, it had apparently, going to the newspapers here, been wrongly interpreted, and the president was promptly told, unambiguously, that Russia had carried out a nuclear test. Well, I have worked in, in great detail on, on that, and very quickly, to me and, and many of my colleagues uh, doing earthquake seismology, it was apparent <coughs> that it was indeed an earthquake, it had a number of characteristics of an earthquake. It was in the oceans, not on land. It had an aftershock. It had a ratio between two different wave types that was characteristic of an earthquake rather than an explosion. And part of the problem here is um, you know, what is the quality <coughs> of the work done, frankly, by those charged with uh, national technical means methods